Hello and welcome to Alaska weather. We will head right on into our hazardous weather because there's quite a lot going on this evening and into tomorrow. Starting with the North Slope and the Chukchi Sea Coast, we have a wind chill warning in effect for the Chukchi Sea Coast that is going to be through 3 p.m. on Thursday. And for the North Slope, that is through 9 a.m. on Thursday. So a little bit longer for the Chukchi Sea Coast than the North Slope. But either way, across that entire coastal area, we're looking at wind chills as low as negative 60 degrees. So definitely dangerously cold wind chills. Uh, not a good time to be out. And if you have to be out, make sure you limit your exposure in those areas. We also have wind chill advisories in effect for the northeastern interior from the Eastern Brooks Range down through Fort Yukon and Bettles. Those are in effect for the Brooks Range through 9 a.m. on Thursday. And for uh, the Bettles and Fort Yukon, uh, Yukon Flats areas, there's going to be an effect through 3 a.m. on Thursday. Also for very cold wind chills ranging from negative 40 degrees Fahrenheit to negative 60 degrees Fahrenheit. So again, at those, those wind chills, it doesn't take very long to get frostbite. Uh, when you're outside, so make sure you're limiting your exposure to those very cold wind chills. We also have blizzard warning in effect for the St. Lawrence Island, for St. Lawrence Island and the Bering Strait coast areas. That is going to be making travel difficult to impossible from midnight tonight through 6 a.m. on Friday. So almost 36 hours, that's going to be in effect with blizzard conditions expected. Finally, we have a winter weather advisory in effect for the Denali area. That is going to be for snow with widespread totals, three to eight inches, up to 10 inches locally, and that is in effect through noon on Thursday. As we shift to the southeast, uh, a, few th a few hazardous weather concerns for the Panhandle. First of all, we'll have a winter I'm sorry, a wind chill advisory in effect for the White Pass area. That's going to be for the coldest time period from tonight into tomorrow morning. So again, a time to limit exposure in the White Pass area with that wind chill advisory in effect. Also have a winter weather advisory in effect for the northwestern, if you will, portion of the Panhandle around the Gustavus area. That's a winter weather advisory in effect through 9 p.m. today. Snow totals expected to be three to six inches, causing some hazardous travel in that area. And finally, we have a winter storm warning in effect for the Juneau area. That is through midnight tonight. Heavy snow expected in Juneau with six to eight inches total. And one interesting fact about this snow in Juneau is that it is a very dry snow with that really cold Arctic air coming into the area. It is a, a very light dry snow that maybe you could even just blow off your car, uh, which is very abnormal for the Panhandle where usually there's that heavy wet snow. But one of the one of these circumstances where it's actually dry snow this time in the Juneau area. Taking a look at our satellite imagery, we can see the clouds associated with that system that's bringing that winter weather into the Panhandle area. We also see across the middle of the state stretching out to about St. Lawrence Island and then further west into eastern Russia, a boundary there and that is bringing our blizzard conditions to St. Lawrence Island and the Bering Strait coast, uh, bringing some precipitation there as well. So if we look at our surface chart for today, we can see all those things. We have our low pressure in the panhandle, bringing our precipitation there. Another low pressure sitting off the east coast of Russia with an occluded front stretching down into the Aleutians. A couple of troughs bringing those winds along with those wind chills up to the northern part of the state. And we can also see in the satellite imagery some fog along the North Slope and certainly with as cold as temperatures are up there that is going to be freezing fog. 
Looking ahead into tonight, we can see that boundary that we saw on the satellite imagery is a stationary front. There's going to be some snow along that boundary, again, with the coldest temperatures north of that front and freezing fog potential for pretty much the entire coast north of that front from Seward Peninsula all the way up the Chukchi Sea Coast and North Slope tonight. For Thursday, that stationary front starting to break up a bit, but still separating those very, very cold Arctic temperatures north of it with slightly warmer, but still cold temperatures south of it with some snow for the Yukon Delta stretching up into the Alaska range. For Friday, we have a trough stretched over from uh, Norton Sound through about South Central with some snow for the entire southwest half of the state. Dry conditions for the northeastern half of the state, but again, still cold temperatures in place. Speaking of temperatures, for Thursday morning, we are looking at our warmest temperatures in the southern part of the Panhandle where we're seeing 30s, still cold temperatures for the northern part of the Panhandle, and then continuing colder temperatures for uh, south central and points west, although not as cold as we've seen before, so mostly above zero at least. For the northern part of the state on Thursday morning, our coldest temperatures, some negative 40s, negative 40 there at Anaktubik Pass, negative 39 there at Arctic Village, and negatives across the board for Thursday morning. And for the southwestern portion of the state, including the Aleutians, much warmer for the Aleutians, although still cold for compared to normal with temperatures in the 20s for Thursday morning and teens for the southwestern mainland. Thursday afternoon, reaching 40 in the southern panhandle, but still around freezing for the northern panhandle. Some warming temperatures into the teens for south central and even 20s and 30s from the Kenai Peninsula over into the Alaska Peninsula. For the northern half of the state, still very cold on Thursday afternoon with temperatures only getting up into the negative 20s and 30s with some negative teens for the central interior around Fairbanks. And Thursday afternoon, we are looking at highs in the 30s for the Aleutians and teens and 20s for much of the southwestern mainland. Friday morning, We'll see, again, cold temperatures for the northern panhandle, 15 there at Skagway, and another chilly morning for south central, 7 degrees at Anchorage, 2 degrees at Talkeetna. For the north slope, once again, very cold temperatures getting down all the way, negative 45 there at Arctic Village. And for the southwest area, 30s for the Aleutians again, and teens and single digits for the mainland. Finally, Friday afternoon, some 40s for the Southern Panhandle again, warming for much of the rest of the area with 20s back in the picture for South Central. A little bit of warming along the North Slope as well as we're seeing some negative teens in places where we were seeing negative 20s and 30s before. And teens for the Southwestern mainland with 30s to 40 for the Alaska Peninsula. And now, Aviation weather around Alaska. On to a look at your aviation forecast starting with Thursday morning. We have some IFR conditions over the southwest portion of the state from the Kuskokwim Delta up to about the Yukon Delta, stretching out into the Bering Sea, including St. Matthew Island. Also, some IFR conditions across the interior of the state over Fairbanks, stretching up almost to the Yukon Flats and some IFR conditions in the southern panhandle in the higher terrain there. For Thursday afternoon, we see improvement across the interior to at least MVFR. We do see some IFR continuing across southwestern portions of the state, although mostly out into the bearing across St. Lawrence Island and St. Matthew Island as we have a boundary moving in with those IFR conditions. Also some IFR conditions developing along the north slope generally from about Ukiagvik east for Thursday afternoon. Friday morning, we see IFR conditions continue to move east, heading into the Seward Peninsula area, as well as back on shore a bit into the southwest part of the state from almost down to Bristol Bay, all the way up to Norton Sound. And for Friday afternoon, those IFR conditions across the southwestern part of the state continue to move inland. So into the 
easternmost parts of the Alaska Range and stretching up all the way across Norton Sound to the northern part of the Seward Peninsula. Also some IFR conditions developing on the east side of the Kenai Peninsula and some IFR conditions just south of the Western Aleutians with that next system coming into the picture. Pass conditions on Thursday, Anaktuvik Pass VFR on Thursday, as well as Adigan Pass VFR. Lake Clark and Merrill Passes both expected to be MVFR Thursday morning, but improved to VFR on Thursday afternoon. Rainy Pass also starting the day Thursday, MVFR, but improving to VFR on Thursday afternoon. Windy Pass actually starting the day IFR on Thursday, but improving to MVFR Thursday afternoon. Isabel Pass MVFR during the day on Thursday, as well as Mentasta Pass MVFR on Thursday. Tanita Pass VFR during the day on Thursday, and Portage Pass also VFR on Thursday. Chilkoot and White Passes both expected to be VFR conditions on Thursday. For our freezing levels on Thursday, we've got our surface freezing level stretching from the Panhandle across the Gulf Coast, Kodiak Island, and the Alaska Peninsula, then up into the Bering and down into the Western Aleutians. South of that in the Gulf, we will see some warmer air ranging from about 2,000 feet just south of Kodiak Island and the Panhandle down to 10,000 feet as we get down into the Southern Gulf. For icing on Thursday, some isolated moderate icing over the Alaska Range and stretching west and southwest across the state. That's going to be icing above about 3,000 feet. Also some isolated moderate icing for the Aleutians above 4,000 feet. And for the higher terrain, mostly of the northern panhandle, we're looking at isolated moderate icing on Thursday above 5,000 feet. Our jet stream on Thursday is going to be generally stretching from the Gulf on over the southern portion of the Alaska Panhandle. So jet stream winds out of the west across the southern Panhandle peaking 155 to 160 knots. Also a bit of a secondary jet out of the northwest over the eastern interior about 100 knots out of the northwest there. At 9,000 feet, our strongest winds are south of the actual state itself, 60 to 70 knots out of the northwest, south of the Panhandle. We do have a secondary maximum over that same area that we saw that secondary jet over the eastern interior, about 60 knots out of the northwest there, and 55 to 65 knots out of the northwest, impacting portions of the area above the Aleutians. And finally, at 3,000 feet, we actually have our strongest winds at 3,000 feet just west of the Bering Strait, mostly over uh, eastern Russia. Also, some peaks along the west coast with southwest, southeast to east winds along the Chukchi Sea coast, as well as some southerly to southwesterly winds peaking around 50 knots for the southwestern portion of the state. Finally, we have considerable moderate turbulence, a few areas for the eastern Aleutians below 3,000 feet, for St. Lawrence Island also below 3,000 feet, for the southwestern interior and western Alaska range below 4,000 feet. Dual polarization technology is a major upgrade to the current radar system. It allows forecasters a better idea of what's actually out there and can help keep you safe. Current radar technology uh, transmits and receives information in the horizontal direction, which is very limited. Dual polarization technology, in addition to the horizontal, transmits and receives uh, vertical energy, which allows forecasters to get information about the size, shape, and phase of the precipitation. We can use that information to better determine the precipitation type to expect at your given location. There you have it. This new technology is currently being installed in radars across the country and is already being used by National Weather Service forecasters to produce better, more accurate forecasts. Learn more here and follow us.
Want to know about the future of weather radar? Well, the National Severe Storms Lab has it here with its new phased array radar. Let's check it out. It's a non-moving radar. It has four faces of the antenna, each pointing in different directions. One of the big advantages is that we're seeing so far, it can sample the, the area around the radar in less than a minute, maybe even a half a minute. And this is five, six times faster than what they can do today. NSSL is leading the development of future weather radar with this project. Learn more here and follow us. The Storm Prediction Center is one of the NOAA weather partners. They are located in the National Weather Center in Norman, Oklahoma. Greg Carbon gives us a glimpse into what the SBC does. Our mission is to analyze and forecast severe thunderstorms and the potential for tornadoes, large hail, and damaging winds from those thunderstorms across the lower 48 states, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year. One of the primary missions of the Storm Prediction Center is the issuance of severe thunderstorm and tornado watches across the country when conditions appear to be coming together to support the development of severe thunderstorms and tornadoes. The world-class meteorologists in the Storm Prediction Center specialize in severe weather and keeping you safe. Learn more here and follow us. The National Severe Storms Lab is working on increasing the lead time for severe weather warnings. The national average for tornado warnings is currently 13 minutes, but more notice would be helpful, especially for those in charge of moving large groups to shelter. Warn on Forecast will help forecasters issue hazardous weather warnings earlier. The project will give them more info about the chances of strong winds, large hail, and even tornadoes. Currently, warnings are created by forecasters looking at the atmosphere outside, understanding its volatility, and then comparing that to how they see the Doppler radar presenting what's going on inside thunderstorms. Warn on forecast is an idea where we're going to take the massive amounts of satellite, radar, and surface data and stick them all into a very high resolution prediction model. And then by producing new forecasts every 15 or 20 minutes, the forecasters hopefully will be able to use that model to produce warnings that extend out to an hour. Before the National Weather Service can use this tool, it must be developed and tested. One big challenge will be deciding how to get the model predictions to the forecasters. I'm going to keep this one very low, I'm just adjusting the track. These hazardous weather prediction models are going to produce a huge amount of output. And this fire hose of data is just too much for forecasters to handle in real time quickly. So in order to help deal with that, NSSL has developed a related project called FACETS. And FACETS is the methodology which will enable forecasters to focus very quickly on the most important threats. Once worn on forecasts and FACETS are proven to be reliable and effective, then forecasters will be better able to inform you of threats nearby. Learn more here and follow us. Hazardous Weather Test Bed is located at the National Weather Center in Norman, Oklahoma. It is used for experiments that will allow forecasters to learn and apply new technologies. The Hazardous Weather Test Bed is a really unique space throughout all of NOAA. And this is where the researchers and the operational folks come together in a common space to solve operational problems and to test new research tools that the research community is working on. The goal is to accelerate the transfer from research to operations of the newest tools and techniques. People come from around the world to collaborate on this unique project. We can bring together not only NOAA people, but also university people, faculty, uh, researchers, uh, private sector meteorologists, folks working in other countries in meteorology, forecasters can all come together 
and focus on what the problem of the day is with the forecasters. Each spring, several experiments occur in the hazardous weather test bed. Learn more here and follow us. What are you looking at? And what are you ignoring? Did you notice the NOAA logo in the corner? Forecasters have a lot of information in front of them too. Every second counts during severe weather and decisions about where to focus are constantly being made. This could be even more challenging in the future. Phased array radar will produce four to six times more information than what we have now, which brings us to the question researchers are hoping to answer. Will more radar information affect forecasters' decisions? From our past experiments, we've learned a lot about how forecasters think uh, during the warning decision process, but we've also learned that those thought processes are very complex, and for that reason, we need a better way to be able to track forecasters' cognitive activity. Inbounds and possibly golf ball sized tails. And eye tracker is a piece of technology that is used to determine in real time where someone's eye gaze is located. And these eye trackers are typically video based, which means a camera sits below a computer monitor and with infrared light and vector analysis, we can determine where a person is looking and how their eyes are moving. Eye tracking is already being used in the medical field and air traffic control. Using similar research methods, NSSL is discovering the benefit for weather forecasting too. Phased array radar will give forecasters a lot more to think about. Understanding their decision-making process will help researchers develop even more user-friendly tools. So what's the benefit for you? Even better weather warnings. To learn more, check us out online and follow us on Facebook and Twitter. And now, marine weather around Alaska. Welcome back for a look at your marine weather, starting with the sea ice edge. Big news in the sea ice edge is the possibility for some growth further south over the next week or so. It's gonna depend on the exact placement of that stationary front in the Bering Sea that we talked about earlier. North of that front is where all that Arctic air is gonna be funneling down and south there'll be warmer temperatures. So if that stationary front sags south, areas north of that are gonna be very cold, allowing for some more ice growth, potentially in those areas where there's a lot of crabbing activity right now. So definitely something to keep an eye on as far as the sea ice is concerned over the next week or so. Marine conditions over southeast for Thursday. We are looking at 15 to 20 knots of wind over the Gulf out of the west and northwest, 10 to 15 knots for the inside waterways. We've got some northerly flow across the northern inside waterways and westerly flow across the southern inside channels. For Friday, looking at winds picking up out of the southwest, southwest for the northern Gulf sorry, out of the southeast for the northern Gulf, 25 to 30 knots, 15 to 25 knots out of the south off the main panhandle itself, and winds increasing in the inside channels to 20 to 25 knots, still with northerly flow uh, up in the Lynn Canal. For South Central on Thursday, we are looking at generally offshore flow out of the north and northwest, 15 to 25 knots in the Gulf and 10 to 15 knots in Cook Inlet. Winds increasing on Friday, strongest winds near the Barrens, about 40 knots out of the northeast. Elsewhere in the Gulf, we're looking at 15 to 35 knots with southwest flow in the western Gulf and southeast flow in the northern and eastern Gulf. For Thursday across the Alaska Peninsula and Kodiak Island areas, we're looking at generally easterly flow, a little bit of southeasterly in some of those areas, 10 to 20 knots with our strongest winds, 25 to 30 knots on the north and south side of the southern Alaska Peninsula. For Friday, those winds coming up as well and switching to generally out of the west and southwest, 25 to 35 knots. For the Aleutian chain, on 
Thursday, we have winds out of the south and southwest, 25 to 30 knots. We have our largest seas in the Western Aleutians, 18 to 19 feet there. A little bit less for the Eastern Aleutians, especially on the Bering Sea side where we're looking at about 10 foot seas. Winds coming up on Friday, especially for the Western Aleutians as that next system comes in, 45 to 55 knots there out of the southeast with 18 to 23 foot seas. Some southerly flow for the eastern Aleutians, 25 to about 30 knots, uh, 40 knots out of the southeast, just south of Atka. For the west coast on Thursday, we have southeasterly to easterly flow, 30 knots up in Norton Sound, peaking 40 knots just south of St. Lawrence Island and 30 knots as we head south into the Bering Sea. Seas outside of the ice edge, about 14 feet down near the Pervolovs, as high as about 16 feet uh, south of St. Matthew Island. Looking ahead into Friday, we'll see those seas come down to 10 to 12 feet. Winds also decreasing some, still peaking around 35 knots out of the west, south of Nunavak Island. And for the north slope and the northwest coast of the state, 10 to 15 knots for the North Slope on Thursday. Offshore flow 25 to 40 knots for the Chukchi Sea as well as the those peak winds about 40 knots out of the east for the Bering Strait area. For Friday, we're still looking at 10 knots for the North Slope, decreasing a little bit in the Chukchi Sea to 25 to 30 knots and decreasing to 15 knots out of the east for the south side of the Bering Strait. Recapping our picture, we have that stationary front that we talked about for tonight is going to be stretched across the Bering Sea from eastern Russia across St. Lawrence Island and into southwestern Alaska. We have freezing fog likely for much of the coast north of that boundary tonight. So we're talking freezing fog for the Seward Peninsula up to the Chukchi Sea coast, as well as the North Slope. We also have those wind chill warnings in effect for the North Slope and Chukchi Sea. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1 800 WX Brief for a formal pre flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go fly. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbor master before you go boating.